Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Worshiping in Styles, worshiping from Sealy's Bay United Church once again for a beautiful day in November, November 8th. I almost thought we should swap out one of our hymns for Walk Softly in Springtime. It's just fabulous out there here in the Bay and around the area. So I hope you're taking the opportunity to, to be out in this glorious bit of fall weather uh, winter may be coming, but it is not here yet, so we are very thankful for that indeed. And it is good to have you worshiping with us once again uh, here as we do this uh, internet-wise, virtually-wise, however you want to say it, 3D is in effect once again. Don, Dave, and Dan are here uh, with you uh, helping in the worship today. I have a few announcements to share with you. The meeting of our official board of Sealy's Bay that's for the pastoral charge, is coming up Tuesday, November 10th at 7.30 p.m., and that is at Olivet United Church, so make note of that. Our online auction, there is a link to that from our Facebook page. A lot of good details there on how that's going to work. It starts on Sunday, November the 15th at 6 p.m., and there are three separate weeks worth of lots, so there will be time for bidding, which will close on the Friday, of the, the relative week. So there'll be a number of things up for bidding on the 15th, then there'll be a new slate on the 22nd, and then another new slate on the 27th. And the items are available to be looked at at the website, which is sbpastoralcharge.ca, but there are links to that as well on the Facebook page. Announcing a virtual story fest which is a fundraiser for Sabara, for the Sealy's Bay and Area Residents Association. Dr. James Raffin has a new book out called Ice Walker, which sounds fascinating detailing the story, basically telling the story, I think, from the sounds of it, of a polar bear as it navigates the polar ice. And we've all seen those pictures of how that's becoming increasingly difficult for the bears to do. So it should be a fascinating story. You know that James Raffin, that's just He's so good at this, and so we have an opportunity to, to hear his gift for storytelling, and that is on Sunday, November the 15th as well at 2 p.m., and I've posted a link to that page on our Facebook page. You can also go to support Sealy's Bay's Facebook page uh, for the link there as well. They are selling tickets for that. It is a fundraiser, and uh, they suggest that you can sit back and have a cup of coffee and just enjoy being in the hands of, of an expert storyteller. So make note of that. And then a couple of things. This is Remembrance Sunday in the church. And for those of you who are regular members of our pastoral charge, we have a tradition of having a Remembrance Day service uh, as close as we can to Remembrance Day, where the Legion takes part in the service, the Branch 491 from Sealy's Bay. Now, of course, we can't do that because of COVID, but we will have a form of a remembrance service here today to have that opportunity to take time to remember, to honor our veterans, to reflect on war and peace in this country. And springing out of that, a couple of announcements. I have heard that some of the, the Legion is concerned this year about the Poppy Fund. Uh, fundraising from poppies is critical. The money from the poppy fund goes exclusively to supporting veterans. And uh, our support officers do such a good job of making sure that veterans receive the benefits to which they are entitled and to help them navigate the government system, as well as just to provide support in any way that they can. And so because there are um, fewer people out and about, just in general, and you know how that works, you usually go out to a store, go to a mall, whatever, oftentimes it's businesses where, or government offices and people are staying at home. So it's, it's getting a bit harder this year for people to raise funds for the poppy funds. So uh, if you do go and get a poppy, put a, put a little bit extra in if you can to, uh, to help support the poppy fund, a good cause. And, that, and the other thing is many legions will be holding services on the 11th, but they're urging people to, to not come down if they don't need to. Uh, to uh, there are many places you can watch online or on television, so please do that. Uh, we had some, there was an article in the Brockville paper about a possible online service here, but I can't see any evidence of that on, on the Legion Facebook page, so I'm not sure where that is, frankly, right now, but um, 
If you can watch online, please do. All right. You see, the only other thing about what I've learned from COVID this week, I know people talk about the COVID bulge that when you're eating, because people are home more, they're putting on weight, but I think there's an opportunity to actually lose a little weight. And, and I'll tell you how, I've seen people getting a little bit of unexpected exercise because of mask regulations. And if you walk from home or you've parked in the parking lot and, driven, and you, you walk up to the front of the store, whatever you're going, I do this, I've seen people do this. You could stand in front of a store. It's kind of amusing to watch as people come up, look at the sign or realize, and then they go, <sighs> forgot the mask. So they have to turn around and go back to the car or back home again. So you're seeing a lot of this, a little bit of extra steps. Uh, mark your Fitbit with that. Um, you might get a few extra steps in because of the whole thing around masks. And we're still not to the point where we remember them every single time. I've done it at the post office multiple times. All right. So enough of that. Here are these words of call for Remembrance Day. The measure of a people's heart is this. Do we remember the sacrifices of the past? Do we work for peace in the present? Do we declare hope for the future? And so we come now before God to name as our dream God's reign of peace, to commit ourselves to that cause, and to remember, let us worship God. And we'll take the time to light the candle. That call to worship, by the way, written by Rod Sykes. And let us take a moment of silence to gather our hearts and minds together before we sing our introit, which is 122 in more voices. This is the day. Let us take a moment, and then we will sing. forgiving, the patience to be understanding, 
and the endurance to accept the consequences of holding to what we believe to be right. May we put our trust in the power of good to overcome evil and the power of love to overcome hatred. We pray for the ability to dream and the faith to believe in a world emancipated from violence, a new world where fear shall no longer lead people to commit injustice, nor selfishness make them bring suffering to others. Help us to devote our whole lives, our thoughts, and our energies to the task of making peace, praying always for the inspiration and the power to fulfill the destiny for which we and all people were created. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that prayer is written by Doug Reed. We are going to enter into a short service of remembrance at this time. And I would invite you, if you are, uh, if the Spirit is with you, to stand, to please do so, and we will sing O Canada. <laughs>
they shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Please be seated. And we read John McRae's famous poem in Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe to you, from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. And we'll sing the hymn number 200, or 523, sorry, in more in Voices United, O God of all the many lands. Oh, God. 
gold and secret fires Shaping a noble destiny of truest nature. May this fair land arcaded up your Scripture reading for this Sunday is from Psalm 78, verses 1 to 7. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell of to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders he has done. He established a decree in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them the children yet unborn, and rise up and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. May God bless this teaching from God's holy word. Amen. And as part of Remembrance Day service, I invited people to recollect on their experiences of war and peace, their understandings of war and peacetime in Canada and what they have learned and how they are remembering today war and peace within our Canadian context, within the Canadian country, and perhaps within our local context as well. As certainly in this community, we are blessed to have still veterans from the Second World War, as well as uh, many other conflicts, subsequent conflicts in Canadian military history, uh, from Korea onwards into uh, Afghanistan, Kosovo. I know many UN peacekeepers in our community, and uh, certainly we remember those in our communities who have laid down their lives during wartime for the country. We hold all of them in our hearts and our minds this day and in the coming days, as this is the season of remembrance for us in this country. My own recollections of, of war and peace and my personal experiences are, are complex. I have to admit that as I look back on my life. I, I grew up and I, I, I played with kids when I was just seven or eight years old who their father was a bombing during the Second World War for a Lancaster with the Royal Air Force in, in England. And they had all kinds of military equipment and memorabilia. And I can remember I had a whole stack of uh, weapons and warfare. There was about 24 volumes of this little encyclopedia. And I had guns in the house, you know, little toy guns. And, and we, would, we would shoot at each other endlessly. And, and so like that aspect of, of, of war was, was very prevalent as a young person. And I remember going to Remembrance Day ceremonies with my parents, and of course my dad was a minister, so, so that was part of the experience for sure, and there were so many more veterans, of course, at that time in the 70s than there are now, and, and just remembering what an experience that was to, to be able to talk with them. Then I went to high school, and, and I think I had moments where, and, and I know I'm not alone in this, where I started to wonder about war, and, peace and, and uh, the, the meaning of war and the purpose of war and, and what it accomplishes and what it doesn't accomplish. And I had those, those strong feelings that there, there was something 
something that I was missing perhaps in, in how I was marking Remembrance Day. And, and was I glorifying war? Was, was that part of a, was that challenging me to understand more deeply what war and peace mean in this country and, and how we work for peace and, and, and is war ever uh, an acceptable way of working towards peace and still struggling really to this day to, to work that out. And then going into ministry and, and ministering to people who have such a variety of understandings of, of war and peace from, again, meeting more veterans and, and uh, meeting people who are pacifists and, and, and listening to all of those people and, uh, and then coming here to Sealy's Bay and being invited to be a padre for the Legion. And once again, you know, enriching my experience and, and my understanding of, of people who serve in the military and, and, having, and getting once again to talk to, to veterans and, and their own experiences and the understandings of war. If you've ever been to the Canadian War Museum, um, that's a real experience and an opportunity to reflect again as they do, I think, a very good job of presenting the history of war in this country and, and, and how it's been intertwined and how we understand ourselves as a nation, but also the ways in which understandings have changed over time. I mean, in Port Hope, where my parents live right now, there's a statue to Arthur Trefusis Henage Williams who was the hero of the Battle of Patash as uh, the, the Northwest Mounted uh, Infantry and, and the, the Army went out and, and with the police um, suppressed the, the, the Métis uprising of Louis Riel and Gabriel Le Mans. And, you know, I've, there's pictures of him being welcomed back to Port Hope because he died on a train on the way back to Port Hope with pneumonia, so he never got to come home after the war, but he led the final charge. And there's pictures of him being brought back uh, in a massive state funeral to, to, to Port Hope and streets were lying and people were cheering. And then by the time I got to school, uh, the understanding of who Louis Riel was and, and who the Métis are, it, it's, just, it's, it's just so different from, from, from what it was like back in those times. So I guess what I'm saying is that the act of remembering during war time and peace time and my own experiences, the act of remembering is a powerful way of bringing perspective, of bringing depth, of bringing seriousness to, to discussing these questions, of, of trying to understand where all of these different voices come from. The voices of war, the voices of peace, the advocates and, and people who are contrary and and, and just the richness and the variety of people's understanding of that experience, even the reality that it, things change over time. So the act of remembrance takes time. And, and I was saying before the service, that's one of the reasons why two minutes of silence can seem like a long time, especially these days where we're so easily distracted and so many things come to us and we have our magic telephones, which constantly beep and remind us of things that we need to do and our schedules and, and all of these things. And amidst all of that noise and all of that clutter, two minutes of silence to remember our war dead is time given to us as gift to stop and to reflect and to take the call to remember seriously. Remembrance in scripture is also a very important thing. For the people of God, remembrance is usually a call to have trust in God. For the psalmist, it is a call to the people to say, if times are difficult, if we struggle to find a way forward, we will not forget that God has been with us, that God has done mighty deeds, that God has protected us, that God has cared for us, that God has walked with us and will continue to do so. Do not forget that. Trust in who God is. Trust that God will be with us yet. And the most powerful way that the psalmists came up with was a call to remember. 
don't forget. And as we look back into our past and we look back into our struggles, we catch glimpses of the presence of the divine, of the holy. Perhaps even as we go back in, into our history and look for ways to reinterpret or re-understand our history, that is also the Spirit of God working with us in an act of remembrance to, to challenge us and to help us to reinterpret. We sang this hymn, O God of all the many lands, and it talks in its own way about the history of this nation, but it was written in 1927 by Mary Susanna Edgar, and it was powerful in its time, and it has come to us, it's been brought forward in time for us to, to sing and reflect on, but, but as I was writing out the words for the Facebook account and, 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 and looking at it, I thought, well, this is certainly one angle of remembrance of this country. We thank you for the sacrifice of venturers of old who dared to cross uncharted seas whose dreams made others bold. And absolutely, we are called to remember those people. They, they, they give us a heritage. But I'm also thinking we are starting to learn more about the heritage of the people who were here to greet the bold adventurers who crossed the mighty seas. Uh, they too have a history. They too have a remembrance of place. Indeed, our indigenous people, remembrance and storytelling is a cornerstone of indigenous culture, of tradition, of sharing, which is why it was so crippling for them to, to be taken out of their places of learning, the young people being taken away from their elders, being taught new things, but being uh, denied the opportunity to remember also the things of old. And so, so much was lost. And it is such a struggle to recover and rebuild when your remembrances are so fragmented and shattered. But our Indigenous people are remembering. And we are called to add their remembrance to our remembrance to strengthen it, to add that diversity, which is so much a strength of who we are as a country. I was thinking about this election in the States. You may have heard there's been an election. I don't know, there's, there's some talk of it here and there and everywhere. And, and there, it looks like there is a new president-elect in Joe Biden. And I've been reading a little bit and listening to some of the pundits and, and I think for a new president coming on, it is important to remember who they are and who they have been. And I think as much as for a lot of people, they would like to see this uh, election result in a hard turn towards progressivism and, and towards uh, new ways of being. You have to remember that, uh, that Senator Biden, when he was Senator and Vice President Biden, was someone who worked with the Republican Party regularly was known as a deal maker, known as somebody who was trying to unify a people, and, and that maybe that's something that's important to remember in, in that country, that where everything is so fragmented and shattered, and everybody seems to be so caught up in the moment and forgetting the roots of, of who they are and how they have struggled to, to become a united country, how often that has involved warfare, but how they are still being called to work for peace in their time. So perhaps it's important to remember that this may be a time where we will not be having bold liberal visions as much as liberals in the Democratic Party would be longing for that, but, but this may be a time to, to remember who the American people are what their history has been, where they have shone brightly, where they have struggled, but to rebuild a sense of the unity of the united part of the states. And, and this might be important for them. So on this Remembrance Day, as we are called to remember Remembrance Sunday, and as we head towards Remembrance Day, I hope that you will have the time 
certainly during the, the, the time of silence, but also take time to remember your own understandings of war and peace, but also what is written about war and peace in this country, the people who can tell you stories firsthand of war, of the challenges that they faced, the struggles that they overcame to help us all to understand a little better who we are called to be. And in the faith tradition, we are called to be children of God. We are called to trust God. We are called to remember what God has done, what God will do. Help us to be a remembering people, O oh God. Help us to walk in trust with you through all the changing seasons and times of our lives. Amen. We are going to sing and Six eighty four. Thank you. Remember it's Sunday and I forget the number of the hymn we're gonna sing. Make me a channel of your peace.
The United Church of Canada has a rich history of saints who have gone before us, but whose influence is still being felt. For many, in the West End of Toronto, it was one strong, kind woman who showed those who encountered her just what amazing things mission and service can do. Betty Gale, nay Thompson, was one of these saints. Betty grew up in China as one of several Mish kids born to missionary parents in North China. She returned in the 1930s after nursing training in Canada at the urging of Dr. Robert McClure, and it was there that she met and married Dr. Godfrey Gale. They had their first child, Marty, just before the Japanese invaded China in 1941 which led first to house arrest, and then three years of internment in POW camps around North China. Betty kept a journal of her family's time during the war, detailing the poor treatment and horrible conditions of the buildings they lived in. But even during the worst times, Betty was always able to find something funny or hopeful to share. The Second World War took its toll on the missionaries. Years later, Betty and Godfrey gave a painful account of the illness and death of Eric Adele, a Scottish missionary and athlete in the 1924 Olympics, another Mish kid who had returned to China to work within his family's mission. His story became famous in the 1981 movie, Chariots of Fire. The missionary's passion for making a difference in the lives of people in other parts of the world, as well as at home, has inspired many to follow in their footsteps. Betty and Godfrey's story and passion live on in those they have influenced. Thanks to mission and service, they are part of a great cloud of witnesses that the United Church of Canada of today is built on. We will remember that. If mission and service giving is already a regular part of your life, thank you. If you have not given, please join in making mission and service giving a regular part of your life of faith. And we thank all who are offering their support, both to the, the ministry here in our local congregations, in the pastoral charge, and also through mission and service, and through ways in which we can give and support to those who are trying to bring hope into people's lives in so many different ways. We also want to say uh, a special greeting to the Holiness Church here in Seelys Bay. They are celebrating their 100th anniversary this year, and today is the service up at the Holiness Church here in Seelys Bay. Now they, I think, are, are full up at this time, so there's, there's no room <laughs> for people to come and worship up there, but, but I will be there representing the United Church in the area as we help our brothers and sisters in faith celebrate a very important milestone in their lives today. Let us pray. Gracious God, in this time of remembrance for this country, this nation, for ourselves, give us the courage to remember well. Give us the strength to take time to give thanks for those who have served this country in so many different ways in peace and war. Those in our community who lost their lives in service. Those who continue to live amongst us today. May we honor the memories of those who have gone before. May we continue to support those who are with us. Help us also, especially, to remember those veterans who struggle to become reintegrated into society, those for whom the horrors of war, the shadows are long, the post-traumatic stress is real. Help us to hold them, to be able to listen to them, to help them in ways that 
will bring meaningful healing to their hearts. For those of us who have lost trust in God, in our governments, in the people around us, who are facing real crises because of the lack of trust and the loss of trust, so much is broken. Help them to find ways to trust again. Whether that is through remembrance of kindness in the past, remembrance of hope and healing, however they may find it, may it be known to them once again. We pray for our Southern brothers and sisters in the United States of America. Help them to overcome the corrosive attacks that are being launched on their democratic system. To restore trust in a process where at its very best allows each one of us to have a voice, to have a say in who will be our political leaders, who we will voluntarily give our power to so that they will lead us in right paths. Such a cornerstone is vital but so easily attacked and so hard to rebuild. May they have the strength to do so. We pray for all those in our communities who are hurting, who are in pain, who are alone and isolated, alienated. May they know your love and your presence. May we be channels of your presence and your peace to others. We pray for those for whom this economy in COVID times has been so crushing, such a burden to bear. Give them strength and hold them up, we pray. We give thanks for those who have served your church, who have spoken your truth to the world, missionaries and others, who have also listened and learned in their encounters with the other. May we too have wisdom to listen and learn from other voices as we hear them, as we reimagine and revision who we are as a people in our past and in our present, and working towards a better future. We ask these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to remember, to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We'll sing another hymn of remembrance, number 527 in Voices United, God as with silent hearts.
Once again, we thank you for being part of the worship service here from Worshiping in Styles for November the 8th and uh, invite you to join us again next week on the 15th. We will be back again, same church time, same church channel. And I think I'm looking at the wrong camera again. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, there we are. But until that time, may the love of God and the peace of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. Oh, now in peace, never be afraid. God will come. of every day. Oh, now in faith, steadfast, strong, and true. Oh, he will guide you in all you do. Oh, my God.